If you're a fan of games with an anime aesthetic or just games based on anime, chances are you've played a game published by Bandai Namco. From licensed games such as Naruto, One Piece and Dot Hack to their own original ideas with the likes of the Tale series. The company has a bit of a rich history in this regard. That said, their published games have often gotten a very mixed reception from the public. Some titles such as Dragon Ball Fighter Z are lauded for their gameplay and visuals, while others such as God Eater and Code Wayne are found lacking in regard to their competitors. It's no surprise then that their new IP, Scarlet Nexus, feels like it's being overlooked as they enter into the gaming market. That said, does the game in any way deserve recognition, or is it again another Bandai Namco title fated to end up only being appreciated by a select few? The basic story setup for Scarlet Nexus is that, in the future, the majority of humans have gained psionic powers, leading to the development of what the devs call a brain punk society. At the same time, however, humanity began to be assaulted by supernatural creatures known as the Others, thirsting for, well, human brains, so to speak. In response, a military team known as the Other Suppression Force, or OSF, is formed, a group of highly trained psionic individuals who can combat the threat. At the start of the game, you take control of one of two newly minted OSF members, the cold and talented Kasane Rondo, or the kind and hardworking Yuito Sumeragi. Now, if all of this sounds very weird, wacky, and anime trophy to you, it's mainly because it is. Each and every design aspect relating to the game seems to center around catering to this aesthetic. The locations and areas you visit often have this softer, washed out coloring to them, accentuated with outlines giving it enough of that hand-on feel. The story, meanwhile, is presented with a combination of cel-shaded anime-style characters in cutscenes and character portrait cut-ins that often feel like they're trying to invoke a manga page. A bit of an odd design decision since the character panels feel very static, in contrast to the cutscenes which are actually pretty brilliantly animated. As the game goes on though, it actually starts to feel less weird as the characters start to show more emotion and movement in these manga panels. Incidentally, did we mention that the game released along with its own anime? Because if you still didn't feel like the game was catering to the anime crowd, the devs are here to quickly remind you of it with their cast of characters whom you are quickly introduced to. You not only have the option for a Japanese voiceover while you're playing, it's kinda hard not to overlook the fact that almost all the characters are designed to hit the bells and whistles of an anime template. You have your cool, confident ice queen, you have your straightforward naive hero, the caring sister, the overly enthusiastic best friend, and so on and so forth. A lot of the initial characterization then comes off as uninteresting and uninspiring as the game takes its sweet time introducing you to everyone. However, yes, however, around the 4 hour mark, the story kicks off into high gear and it becomes more and more interesting. You are slowly woven into this tale of intrigue and conspiracies with regard to both psionics and the creatures, and how the groups involved are trying to solve or take advantage of the situation and the characters involved in them. Despite the anime aesthetic, it actually touches upon some frankly dark elements, which are sadly a bit overshadowed by the fact that the sci-fi envelope they push tends to feel a little too over the top at times. It never fully outgrows those tropes mentioned before, but the stories and characters do get enough development and exposition that you find yourself more and more interested and in heading to the next story point to see what will happen. Between you and me though, some of the later stuff which occurs in the story actually happens a little too fast, and the people involved accept the situation a little too readily for my liking. A part of the fault for this of course lies with the fact that the events leading to the reveals are only elaborated on from either Kasane's side or Yuito's side, and not both. Well, both Kasane and Yuito are members of the OSF. How they react to and see the events around them are quite different. This leads to both their stories diverging for the most part and converging at key points, often leading to more intrigue and even outright hostility between the two. So you miss out on the build-up from one side of the perspective 
and you get only the reveal when their story is intertwined, making it feel a bit jarring and surreal. Needless to say, who you chose at the beginning of the game will largely determine the lens by which you view the story through, and you need to play both campaigns to really appreciate it. Don't let that disappoint you though. Even if the story has a slow and a bit of a jumbled start, the setting itself however is done very well. The game does a good job of putting you into this pseudo sci-fi world which is under attack by these frankly horrifying creatures. For those of you who are even further interested in the world, you're given additional hints, dialogue and data logs expounding the characters, locations and enemies you meet, further giving them that little flavor that makes them integrate a little bit better into the world. If you're an anime fan, it's most likely you'll enjoy the story. If you're not though, well, it just starts off painfully slow, but it does indeed get better. With perhaps what I believe the weaker elements of Scarlet Nexus out of the way, let's get into what it does best, the combat. At its core, Scarlet Nexus is an action game with RPG elements. Like other games in the genre, i.e. Devil May Cry, you are often directed down linear pathways with enemies to engage against where sometimes you'll be bluffed off from proceeding until you clear said set of enemies. Rinse repeat this formula until you reach the boss of the area and then you start it all over again in another location. Your character of choice alters combat a bit here. Kasane attacks by throwing and manipulating her knives with her powers, making her a mid to long range fighter. Yuito, meanwhile, prefers to go in even closer with sweeping sword strikes to take down his enemies. At the core of it, both of them have the same moveset. You have your standard jump, dash and combo attacks. Your second attack however is either a backstep or a sweep attack and is used primarily to fuel their psychokinesis power gauge. With enough of this gauge, they can use their powers to manipulate objects around them with the trigger buttons. Items which can be picked up quickly with the right trigger are more or less thrown at opponents to knock or smash them down. Items which are picked up with the left trigger meanwhile take more time to do so but often do more damage and involve a bit more interactivity. This primarily takes the form of a QTE, but depending on where you are you might find objects which you can manipulate in other ways. Move! Your normal attacks can be strung into your psychokinetic attacks and you can do the reverse when you chuck an object at an enemy and get that brief slowdown window. Attacking during this allows you to quickly close in with a follow-up attack. The basics of combat is to seemingly alternate between your normal attacks and your psychokinetic attacks to either empty the enemy's hit point or to crush the enemy's defenses, indicated by a yellow gauge underneath their health bar. Once it's depleted, you can do a special cinematic attack known as a brain crush, killing most normal enemies in one hit. Throughout the course of the game, you will also unlock what is known as a brain drive and a brain field. A brain drive is a super mode for the character which buffs your attack, speed and psychokinetic powers. It's somewhat surprisingly and annoyingly automatically activated when you both dish out and receive enough damage. A brain field meanwhile is a step further beyond your brain drive where you're teleported to a special area in which your moveset is completely changed to include your psychokinetic powers. Unlike your base brain drive which is deactivated automatically, you have to manually switch off your brain field. Failure to do so will lead to your death, making it a bit of a risk reward mechanic where you try to get the maximum mileage out of it before your untimely demise. The game also allows you some character growth through a skill tree called a brain map. You put in points you gain from leveling to build up your character the way you want. My overall feelings of the brain map is kind of mixed though. It's nice that you get a modicum of control over how you want to customize your character. However, all of the abilities you get from it feels like they're enhancements to your current moveset. And by the end, it actually feels like your expanded kit. It should have really been your original kit at the start of the game. The same can be said for your character equipment. Most of them are just straight up upgrades to older weapons without really providing any wearing builds. The exception to this is in your plugin and fashion screen. Though it takes a while, later plugins or accessories do allow you some amount of build customization. 
your fashion accessories meanwhile allow for a lot of customization but for the most part a lot of the stuff feel like they are of the joke variety at least to me so i personally intended not to use them now one thing to keep in mind is that unlike standard action games your character commits to your attacks in scarlet nexus meaning that if you start attacking you'll be locked in that animation before you can jump or dash away for safety the result is that you have to be less spabby and more often more mindful of when to attack and when to retreat, unless you want to be animation locked to death. I don't mean it in a negative way though. If anything, it prompts you as a player to be more tactical in regard to which attacks you use and when to use them. What you really need to keep in mind is the camera sensitivity and the lock-on. The defaults for these are a bit finicky, to say the least. I really recommend you adjust these, and even then they can feel a bit awkward. Camera movement aside, both Kasane and Yuito also have a tendency to aim their attacks away from their lockdown targets if you are holding down a direction. On the one hand, it is useful to aim at other enemies which are crowding around you, but it also feels like it kinda subverts the purpose of a lockdown when that happens. You have to avoid pressing any direction while attack to have them actually aim at your intended target. And that takes some time to get used to. In addition to your chosen character, you are accompanied by your cast of party members, two of which who are in the field with you for mixed effect. While both Kasane and Yuito share the power of psychokinesis, your other party members have their own variation of a psionic power. The struggle arm system, or SAS as the game calls it, then allows you to temporarily use their powers as your own. Electrokinesis, duplication, invisibility, if your party member has it, you can use it. And to be honest, I was completely taken aback by how significantly this affected my combat capability. Each of your party abilities have a specific use, generously outlined by the game, which makes it well suited for certain situations. But even without that specific use, it's hard not to be impressed by how versatile your teammates' powers can be. Yeah, you can use hypervelocity to slow down time and attack faster enemies, but can also be used to buy your own breathing room to heal yourself, or to keep heavy enemies in an aerial combo. Yes, you can use electrokinesis to stun enemies who are soaked in water, but it can also be used to hit aerial bone enemies with the sparks that fly off from them and buff your own damage in the process. The icing on the cake is when you learn to simultaneously activate two or more of your friend's powers, allowing you to combine the effects for even more of a technical advantage. Like say combining invisibility with duplication so you can safely throw multiple objects at unaware enemies, just to name a single use. The extent of your friend's combat prowess does not end here however. During the course of the game, your adventure is divided into two stages. An active phase, where you go through the area to your next story objective. And a standby phase, where you and your team recoup at your headquarters. During the standby phase, you can interact with your teammates by giving them gifts to improve your relationship with them, similar to the bond system in Persona. Unlike Persona, you can see your friends actually fiddle around with these gifts, which is a nice touch. And also unlike it, the events which occur aren't necessarily positive, in fact, some of them can feel outright hostile, as your party members often call out certain actions committed by your chosen character. Hey! Don't insult me! I would never betray him! Uh, I guess negotiations have broken down. Regardless, the end result however is that you progress your bond level with him or her. Possibly because you gained a better understanding of them. Now this increases the time for which you can borrow their abilities and unlocks even more team combinations. As the game goes on, you can spend a portion of your SAS gauge to have them attack for you. Party members will warp in to defend you from attacks, call out when an opportune moment arises to swap places with you. The nature of the borrowed power itself can change with these bond events. They will even very rarely, and surprisingly, revive you when you fall in battle. What are you doing? Thanks, sorry for the trouble. This really caught me off guard since you really do not see such a thing in this type of genre. 
Needless to say, if there was ever a game which made you feel like your teammates are a force to be reckoned with, it is this game. You feel really gimped without their powers later on, especially once you get used to relying on them. Make no mistake, you will be relying on these powers to fight the enemies in the game. And since we are on the topic of enemies, let's get one thing straight. The enemy design itself is amazing. Every enemy is an amalgamation of everyday objects and human limbs which does have that unnerving quality when you ponder on it. While the designs themselves are stellar, how they function as enemies is however, feel like they are well, instead of say a palette swap, let's call them a property swap between them. One enemy for example may shoot water, another slightly differently designed enemy from this one may shoot oil instead. You might have a foe who's armored on the back and another armored on the front. That's not to say there is a lack of variety between them. A lot of the enemies actually have different ways of going on the offensive. Some of them will create mist to block you over you, hide inside steel boxes, go invisible, charge at you in suicide runs. These are particularly annoying. It all prompts you to make clever use of your abilities to counter them. It's just that I kind of wish we had even more of this variety and not the slightly enhanced property swap we get later on with some of them. Having said that, a playthrough on normal due to your own powers and that of your teammates powers, as well as a generous availability of save points and shop point, the game is not particularly difficult. Some bosses might give you a run for your money, but it's still overall pretty easy on the standard difficulty. During standby phases you can also pick up side quests from NPCs in town which are either fed quests or those which ask you to go kill something, usually by using a specific move or power. Though I personally enjoy the combat enough, I can see how tedious this might be for some people. It doesn't help that some of your moves, such as brain drive, are not under your control. So you have to find that specific timing where you not only have that condition active, but then hope you can reach your target in time to count for completion. What's worse is that the rewards are more often than not, not quite worth it. Many of the stuff you get are naturally unlocked in the shop in exchange when you progress the story. Mind you, the reward from these side quests usually appear at a point earlier than it's available in the shops. But it kind of feels neat when you pick up some of the side quests later. The only particular side quest I'll tell you all to keep an eye on is the one that happens post game. You really want to do those. So, with all that in mind, would I recommend Scarlet Nexus? The game is, by all means, not perfect. You have issues tied to its camera and controls. You have quite a bit of backtracking to do, especially if you're doing the side quests with their really menial rewards. And the story starts off really slow. At the least, you might not be happy with the pacing issues of the game. It doesn't feel all that properly balanced. All in all, you might be tempted to skip it. And. It honestly feels like that this is exactly what is happening right now. I really don't see many people talking about this game. And here's the caveat. I kind of feel like it's a shame. If you can weather the few hours for everything to clip, Bandai Namco has made a pretty stellar entry into their lineup of anime games. Not only do you have two character campaigns to play through, which if you have a completionist nature might take you around 30 to 40 hours give or take. Even after that, you can then access the other side with the second character on a new game plus feature, to burst through it, to see what happens there and to experience what you want to experience. The story itself goes into really unexpected places too. Mind you, I rolled my eyes at some of the stuff which happens because it felt overly melodramatic, but at the end of the day, the cast of characters do grow on you. Even with the jumbled pacing, the presentation really keeps you hooked. With combat being the highlight of the game. While you will see the occasional bug or so, nothing is really unplayable either. It performs really well almost all of the time, at least on the PS4, which we use for the review. Visually not everything is striking, but again, now and then the game will surprise you. And this is all backed by a really excellent soundtrack, which considering the length of this review I am inclined to sadly leave as a footnote. 
I have a feeling though that for many players the soundtrack will hit a pretty favorable note. So, coming back to the question we asked before, would I recommend Scarlet Nexus? Let's make a compromise to this. If you're an anime and video game action fan, pick it up, no questions asked. If you're not a fan of anime, but the action combat seems appealing to you in some way, take a look at the demo. The demo already comes with quite a bit of your overall kit unlock, and ought to give you an idea of how it works. I hesitate to get on top of the internet mountain and shout praises for Scarlet Nexus. It's not perfect after all, but at the very least I can watch on giving it a bit of a lengthy try. If not the full game, then the demo. Again, I'm a bit surprised that not many people are talking about this game. Despite its flaws, it's done well enough that it's pretty enjoyable. Honestly, the overall experience really met my expectations. In a world of remakes and rehashes, the company has brought us something not completely cookie-cutter in the action RPG genre. So why not stay and dive in into the pseudo-cyberpunk world of Scarlet Nexus? Who knows? You might find yourself bonding with its pretty peculiar characters and its pretty stellar combat. Thank you.